with this tent. Can you all hear me back there? If yes. I project. Well, I'm exhausted just hearing that. <laughs> um, I appreciate being here today. Um, uh, you have a sheet with you, and we'll refer to the sheet a couple of times as we go through. It's on the table for those of you. And uh, for those of you, does everybody have a copy? Great. Okay, good. Um, I'd like to start by showing you a film clip um, from a Japanese film made in 1953. I picked something that could not be less popular. It's in black and white. It's an old film. It's in Japanese. Um, there are no subtitles. Any of you speak Japanese here? You do? Okay, so you'll understand. For our purposes today, the dialogue is less relevant, so you'll be privileged to understand what's being said, possibly. But let me just give you the, the story. We're only going to watch one scene. By the way, how much time do we have? What's 12.50. 12.50, okay, great. Um, I'm just going to show one scene. And the context for the scene is this. This is a story that takes place in medieval Japan during a period of civil war when warlords were contesting with one another for the power to unify Japan. But the story is not about highfalutin warlords or samurais. The story is about two humble potters. Um, and these potters get the idea that if they leave the small village in the mountains that they live in, and go to the city, they can sell their wares at higher prices. So in other words, they're, they're war profiteers, basically. They want to they benefit from the Civil War. One of the potters we're not going to worry about. He wants to be a samurai, and so we'll just let him go off and be a samurai and not worry about it. The other potter, whose name is Jinjuro, has a wife and a child. And the wife is very concerned about him going off to the city by himself, but he decides anyway to go because he wants a better life for his family. Um, so he goes into the city, he sets up a little shop, lays out his wares, and this extraordinarily beautiful woman who looks very much like a princess comes by, sees his pots, and, and tells him that they're the most beautiful pots she's ever seen. And she flatters him and invites him to her neighboring castle. And so he packs up the pots that she's liked and he goes to the castle. And she lives there with her servant, but only with one servant. And she's all by herself and it looks very strange. And she again continues to flatter him. And what we, what we gradually discover is that this is a ghost princess. This is very much a Japanese motif here. These beautiful long-haired women who are who have been dead but who have um, this passion for unrequited love and so he falls in with her and he has an affair with this with this ghost princess and one day when he's going back to get more pots there is a um, a priest a buddhist priest who looks at it looks at his face and he feels like he sees death written all over his face and he asks him you know, what's going on, and Jinjuro, our potter, explains what's been happening. And the Buddhist priest then takes his shirt off and writes on his back a Buddhist prayer to, to essentially save him from the clutches of this ghost princess. To make a, long, a longer story shorter, um, he succeeds in escaping from the ghost princess, and he, by this time, he's lost his pots. His wares have been taken over by the army, and he has nothing to show for uh, his leaving his little village and his wife and his child. What we see, but he doesn't see, is we also see a scene where his wife and child are on a mountain road. They've decided to leave the village and go searching for him, and they run into a group of marauding soldiers and we're not quite sure what's happened to her, but we think she's either been violated or she's been killed, but we're not quite sure. Cut to the scene that you're about to look at, where our friend Jinjuro 
enters the village and he sees everything in disarray. The village has been, has been uh, it looks like it's been abandoned. And let's look at this scene. And what I'm going to be interested in asking when, when the scene is over with is a very simple, I'm going to ask a very simple question, that is, what did you see in the scene? What did you actually see going on? Okay, can everybody see all right? Because if you can't see, you can't answer the question. Miyagi. 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 おかえりなさい。さあ。さあ。さあ。さあ。さあ。さあ。さあ。さあ。さあ。さあ。さあ。さあ。さあ。さあ。さあ。さあ。さあ。さあ。さあ。さあ。さあ。さあ。さあ。
too well at this. <laughs> can you all over there who are on the, uh, who are off campus, can you all see okay? Uh, yeah, okay, great, thank you. Okay, talk to me. Yes, please. There's a note from Dennis. Dennis. Focus of the scene starts with him arriving, but then as they sit by the fire, it zooms in on her. Then the camera angle switches to behind her, so we're almost taking her point of view for the rest of the scene, where she watches him go to bed and then covers them up. It seems that she is the real focus of the story and how his actions affect her. Dennis, very perceptive, very good observation. I'm going to come back to that in just a second. One of the things that, that you would discover clearly in the next scene uh, as Jen Juru and his little son sit there sleeping is that the village elders break in on him and um, explain to him that his wife, in fact, has been killed on that mountain road with the soldiers. So we discover definitively in the next scene that she, she in fact, is dead. So Dennis's point is very nice. When they're sitting there by the fire, you'll notice that the camera just moves ever so slightly and excludes Jinjura from the frame. And that shifts the point of view of the scene from him to her. It's a very subtle thing. It's no more complex 
and just to move like this. And all of a sudden, the scene is about her. It's not about him anymore. What else did you see? Anything else? What else did you notice? Anything else stand out? Yes, please. I just noticed a lot of shadows. I don't know exactly, but I just kind of saw that as a motif. There's still a lot of kind of stuff with light and darkness and shadow. Mm -hmm. When did you first notice, when did you first have that observation? When did that thought first occur to you? Do you remember? It was, it was probably within a couple minutes, and I don't remember the exact moment, but one of the, the moments that really stood out was when she sits down and, and obscures the fire completely, and it's almost completely pitch black. Right. And then um, she lights a, a fire again, so you can see again. But there's, there's a little bit there where she kind of completely shuts off right. the light. Right, and she becomes virtually a silhouette. Right. Yeah, let's come back to that in a second, please. Well, there was a spotlight, too, on, I think they were sandals. Sandals. Is that what, there was a little spotlight there, and then she moved them, and then the light went out, and she was in the dark mm -hmm. there as well. Okay, good. For quite also, a while. Also a good observation. What were the sandals about? What was that about, do you think? Maybe his, uh, something about his journey, perhaps. The, I'm not sure. Okay, but good, good observation. What else? Anything else you noticed? Please, Spencer. Oh, oh we have Zane. Another. Zane, when he first came in, the house was empty, right? Right. Then on his second pass, there was a fire going and she was there. And then Spencer to everyone, lots of says, yes. Zane, also, good observation. Um, any, anybody else notice that? that? You pick up on that? What, what's that all about? What's going on there? He enters the house and he begins calling his wife's name. We see him. You remember it. He comes in. He calls his wife's name. He crosses. As he crosses, we see the, the furniture. If we could see, if this were a beautiful 35 millimeter print, you'd be able to see even more clearly. But everything's in shadows. The house is dark. The furniture is turned over. Then he comes to the, they come to the end of the camera move. He goes outside the door, still calling her name, or on the other side of the house, and the camera, without a cut, without an edit, swings back and moves and then gradually reveals the furniture is turned upright, the fire is lit in the hearth, she has a lamp lit, she's preparing his meal, he comes back through the door, and they're reunited. Any other observations about that? Yes, please. Well, just the thought that occurred to me in that was that maybe they were both dead or ghosts and were now reunited because suddenly the environment was all changed and it was all peaceful. So, well, what, what, again, what we do know, what we learn from the next scene is that she is the one who's dead. So what does that continuous camera movement have to do with anything? Why? why? Why a continuous camera movement? Why a scene like that when he first discovers her with no edits, no cuts? To show that Any guesses? Yes, I'm sorry, please. To show the supernatural nature of it? Yeah, you're pushing in the right direction. But what, what exactly do, we mean, do you mean by supernatural nature? It yes. could be like with no like balances on no cuts. It could be that it's like a pulling connection between this world and some supernatural. Great. You've got it. Yeah, that's exactly right. One of the virtues of making movies is that you get to play with time. There's a famous book called Sculpting in Time by a Russian director. And that's an apt title here because what the, what the director of this film, Mizuguchi Kenji is his name, what he's doing is he's playing with the idea of time. And time can be manipulated in a couple of ways in films. Well, probably more than a couple of ways. One is by editing, where you get cuts. You, you see something, if, you've, if any of you are fans of the Marvel Studio movies, I don't know if any of you are, you're probably all too mature for that, and don't go to see <laughs> Captain America, Civil War, that kind of stuff. But you'll notice that, that there is a rhythm to the editing. And typically, when the action is high, you don't stay on one shot any more than two or three seconds at most. But what that, what that tends to do is compress time, intensify it. 
But in this particular case, as you rightly observe about the supernatural and as you rightly pointed out, the director is manipulating time by extending the shot continuously so that there is no distinction between the world of the living and the world of the dead. It is a continuum. It's a comment about the nature of reality. There's an interesting quote here from Flannery O'Connor. Are any of you fans of Flannery O'Connor? Any of you know her work? It's the second quote on the page. It says, Christian doctrine is an instrument for penetrating reality. It's about the only thing left in the world that surely guards and respects mystery. The artist is an observer, first, last, and always, but cannot be an adequate observer unless he is free from uncertainty about what he sees. So this is the director, the, the management of the shot, the way it was figured out, the way it was figured out. And when I was at Sundance many years ago, we had the privilege of bringing the cinematographer who shot this. His name was Kazuo Miyagawa. We brought him to Sundance, and we showed Ugetsu to all of the Sundance participants. And we talked specifically about this, this particular shot. And he said, yes, yes, he said, the director and I worked, they worked this shot out together. But the idea was to essentially dissolve the, ba the boundary between the living and the dead dissolve the boundary between this world and the next. So good observation, that's exactly what's going on here. Let me come back to the sandals for just a second, see if we can just penetrate a little bit further. What else does she do? What other actions does she perform once the scene is hers? Once we've put Jinjuro to sleep with the boy, the scene then becomes her, we see the silhouette, she lights the lamp, she's already dusted off the sandals, then she does what? She starts, yes. She starts mending. Yeah, she starts mending. She picks up his, his garment and she begins to mend it. So we take the sandals. She's already been preparing dinner when we first see her. Then she begins mending. And what's her attitude emotionally? What, what are we seeing from her? Any of you pick up on that? Yes, please. Well, like Wait at the back. beginning, she like. She starts to cry, or she like covers her her mouth, and so I guess I wonder: is that did she just then realize that she was dead, and then she goes about doing her daily work anyway? Um, I don't know, but she seemed very sad at the beginning, but then she gets into the rhythm. She covers up her husband, and then she goes and does her, I guess, what she always does, and then she doesn't seem as sad. Very nice, very nice observation. She begins these absolutely ordinary simple daily tasks that in one fashion or another we all perform, but this recognition is there that she's doing them for the last time. Yes, please. Well, and maybe this is reading way too much into it, but you talked about how there's a civil war going on beforehand in the movie. You talked about how he essentially cheated on his wife with his ghost princess, so it's possible that the mending is somehow some kind of metaphor for mending other things that are wrong in the situation, whether it's, you know, the tear between the cultures in the Civil War, or mending the relationship between her and her husband because it's been broken by the, the affair, or something like that. Actually, that had never occurred to me, and I think that's a very nice observation, because in the very last scene of the film, which we don't have time to look at today, but in the very last scene, um, we hear her voice uh, as he is working at his pottery. Again, he's back in the mountain village. He's raising his son by himself now. He's working in his pottery. And we heard her voiceover come back and talk about how happy she is that he has found peace. And the essence of her dialogue, her voiceover dialogue is she's forgiven him for anything that he's, he may have done uh, in the past. So the idea of mending, nice idea. Please. From Nate. Nate. Her continuing to act upon objects in the real world while he is sleeping shows us that she is more than just a memory or a figment of his imagination. She is a part of the real world independent of him. Great observation, absolutely on target. That's a great observation. Um, and I think that's, a, in fact, in many ways, that's a critical observation. And that draws me to um, back to the sheet of paper that you've got in front of me. 
There's a quotation from Joseph Smith at the top of the page. Somebody like to read that for us? Anybody have that, please? All men know that all men must die. What is the object of our coming into existence, then dying and falling away to be here no more? This is a subject that we ought to study more than any other, which we ought to study day and night. If we have any claim on our Heavenly Father for anything, it is for knowledge on this important subject. <coughs> How many of you have read that before? You know that quote before? Mr. McDonald? Yes. Um, you may, it may or may not occur to you to ask the question, why is Van Wagner coming in here and talking about death? I mean, what does that have to do with, with your education and, and where, you're, where you're going with your instructional psychology degrees? Well, I'll tell you, there are two reasons. One is, um, this has been a, a really interesting couple of years for me. Um, just a little over a year and a half ago, we lost our oldest daughter, who was 40, to cancer. And uh, my wife and I were both with her in the last couple of weeks of her life. And um, this last Christmas has been interesting because I lost a former business partner who passed away in Austin, Texas. And we lost a very close friend of ours who's a member of our ward um, who was out uh, shoveling snow and didn't come back in the house. Uh, he was on his he was on his four by four and and pushing it around. And his wife heard the heard the four wheeler running and went out and found him just lying there by the four wheeler, uh, with his face up to the stars. Uh, and he went just that fast. Um, and then I had another dear friend. How, I don't know, how many of you know the art of Jim Christensen? Any of you know his artwork? Some of you do. Jim just passed away here a couple of weeks ago, and Jim and I had a chance to work on projects and projects for the church together. And so um, I've been thinking a lot about death, particularly as I've been looking at new movies that have just come out. Um, I'm, I'm a member of what's called the Director's Guild of America, and so at the end of the year, I get screening copies, DVDs of, of not all, but most of the new movies that come out. and so. Uh, in terms of nominating uh, directors for DGA awards, uh, I get to look at the end of the year at all the, everything new that's coming out. And because of the, the deaths of these friends and our daughter here about a year and a half ago, um, I've been asking myself the question, you know, what have I learned about death in the process of um, going through all of these, all of these deaths? So one of the things that I've been very interested in um, since that experience is how the Prophet Joseph Smith saw death. Um, I, think, I think it's a given that everybody, including Joseph, who lost children and, and certainly lost friends over the course of the Missouri persecutions, Joseph certainly mourned and felt deeply, as deeply as we do. How many of you have lost immediate members of your family? Some of you. So it's, some of you feel this perhaps very keenly. So I've been very interested uh, in recently in, in this notion of where the line is between what we experience in mortality and when you tip over that line and all of a sudden you're no longer in this world but you're in the next world, you're in another world. Which is one of the reasons that this piece uh, I found so moving. I first saw this film um, when I was a student here at BYU, an undergraduate student here at BYU. I read an essay by a film critic who called this one of the two or three greatest films he'd ever seen. And I found myself fascinated by, uh, by something, by a comment that was that absolute. What do you mean by one of what, you know, what if somebody asked me what, what are the two or three greatest films you've ever seen? I, at that point in my life, I couldn't have answered that question. I thought, everything I see is great. It's all wonderful. And I read this essay, and I actually got in my Volkswagen, because there were no DVDs or videotapes then. It was a long time ago. I got in my Volkswagen, and I drove to Berkeley, California, the Pacific Film Archive. Because I had a friend who was LDS who was the archivist of the Pacific Film Archive in Berkeley. 
and I'd written him in advance, written him a letter, a real letter, uh, and said, I, you know, I so want to see this film, Ogetsu Monogatari, which translated means Tales of the Rain and the Moon, from which the story is taken. And he said, sure, come on down, I'll set up a screening. So I drove down, got into a screening room, all by myself, nobody else there, and I saw this movie. And when we got to this scene, even though I had, you know, I had not experienced extensively the death of loved ones, um, I was just overwhelmed. I mean, it's like the scene reached out and just embraced me. And I've never gotten over it. Um, okay, I'm just looking for more comments there. No, nothing, nothing new. You let me know, Spencer. Um, so I began to think about this question of the culture of death. Um, and thinking about the movies that I've seen <clears throat> over the last few weeks. Uh, any of you seen, uh, any of you gone out to, maybe, maybe none of you are movie crazed like I am. Anybody seen A Monster Calls? Is it out already? It is. I've read the book. <coughs> yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to the movie. I think particularly those of you, who, and may, may, I don't know if you agree with this, but particularly in, given your degree focus, that's a movie that you all should see. Yeah, the book was an amazing piece of visual storytelling. Yeah, and, and the movie is no less remarkable. And the movie centers around a young boy, 12 years old, 14 years old, struggling with the death of his mother for cancer. And it's essentially a meditation on how this young boy deals with his anger and with his, um, with his anger and his fear over the loss of his mother. Strongly recommend it. Um, there's another film. Have any of you seen Arrival? Some of you have seen Arrival. Here's a film that begins also with um, time shifting going on at the beginning of the film where we see a woman played by Amy Adams who has a daughter. She's a single mom. She's raising the daughter. And as we move through time and the daughter grows up, you see the daughter contract cancer, passes away. Um, and that launches us with the arrival story of the arrival of the aliens. Um, uh, any of you have seen uh, Manchester by the Sea? That's getting a lot of attention. Uh, got, an Academy, got Academy Award nominations a couple of days ago. Uh, it's a story that also has to do with a young father, <coughs> excuse me, a story that has to do with a young father who inadvertently causes a fire that um, kills his children uh, and how he's dealing with it subsequent to that event. Um, any of you seen, uh, have any of you seen Captain America Civil War? Yeah. I've seen it, don't, don't be modest. <laughs> um, there, is, there is an assumption at the core even of these Marvel films or the Star Wars movies, or the Star Trek movies, whatever, you, whatever your passion is. But there's always an assumption that's at the center of the movies, and that assumption is that the worst thing that can happen to you is what? Death. Death is the, death is the worst thing that can, that can happen. So there's a sense in which, either deeply embedded in these stories that have created their own mythologies in our culture, there's a sense in which death surrounds us, even in our popular entertainments. And it certainly surrounds us uh, if you have an extended family and you have that kind of experience. So I state the obvious when I say that. So I found a book, which I recommend to all of you. We'll stop here for some questions, if there are any. I found an interesting book <clears throat> um, by Samuel Morris Brown, who's a pediatric uh, surgeon uh, up at the University of Utah Medical Center. And the book is called In Heaven as It Is on Earth, Joseph Smith and the Early Mormon Conquest of Death. And the book is an extended um, study in how Joseph Smith expanded the boundaries between mortality and, and between this life and the next life. And how Joseph saw, excuse me, can't talk how Joseph saw 
the experience of living as a continuum that crossed the boundary between life and death, very much as we've seen Ms. Gucci attempt to do in this remarkable little scene. Let me just read, uh, let me just read this, because um, I want to stop here in just a second. I believe that elements of the older death culture, and he's talking now about the culture of the early Mormon experience, particularly its emphasis on the deathbed as what? A place of healing, community, and vision could improve our experiences when, despite our best efforts, we too confront the end of our mortal sojourn. My impression of the legacy of Joseph Smith is that what matters is who we see beside us when we discover that we are in the precincts of death, in the borderlands between life and death. We need not be alone. Early Mormons chose repeatedly to commit to each other to covenant a loyalty that could withstand death. Religion for Joseph Smith and his followers provided a company of saints who could walk toward and earnestly, anxiously through death with each other. The journey, hopefully extending through the breadth of cosmic space and time, mattered to the extent that was undertaken with others. Um, if any of you have, do any of you have scriptures with you? Everybody goes to follow me. Um, two scriptures, 42nd section of the Doctrine and Covenants, if you have, you have your scriptures with you there. Verses 46 and 47. Can somebody share those with us? NC 42, 46, and 47. <coughs> Anybody have it? Yes, please. And it shall come to pass that those that die in me shall not taste of death, for it shall be sweet unto them. And they that die not in me, woe unto them, for their death is bitter. Interesting phrase about death being sweet. Um, I want to go to one more scripture, if you would, from the 121st section of the Doctrine and Covenants, verses 43 and 44. Somebody find that for us. This is one you all know. Yes, please. Reproving the times with sharpness when moved upon by the Holy Ghost, and then showing forth afterwards an increase of love toward him whom thou hast reproved, lest he have seen thee to be his enemy that he may know that thy faithfulness is stronger than the force of death. Interesting. We always, we tend to focus, at least I do, on the reproving the times of sharpness part of this, right? Um, but then that interesting phrase afterwards, showing an increase of love toward him whom thou hast reproved, lest he esteem thee to be his enemy, that he may know that thy faithfulness is stronger than the cords of death. So we're given a context here. The context is love. The context is an increase of love that another individual with whom you've had some contest, you've had some conflict, will understand that your love is stronger than the cords of death. And there's a, final ver there's a final scripture here that I find so breathtaking. Um, this, this one verse here, it's just a couple of verses down. Uh, this one verse to me is like the Mizuguchi scene that we just saw. This is something that I've read and reread over the years, and I feel like I can never get to the bottom of this one verse. The verse reads, it's verse 46. Anybody have that? It's the very last verse in 121. Yes, please. The Holy Ghost shall be thy constant companion in thy scepter, an unchanging scepter of righteousness and truth. And thy dominion shall be an everlasting dominion, and without compulsory means it shall flow into thee forever and ever. The phrase that I find so breathtaking in that scripture is, and without compulsory means it shall flow unto thee forever and ever. If ever there was a phrase that is chewed violence of any form, any kind, any sort of coercion, um, any sort of anger, um, any sort of manipulation, uh, any sort of 
pressure that stems from cause and effect, which is what our physical world is dominated by. Here is a, here is a phrase without compulsory means that opens up an entire cosmic perspective. It again is Joseph Smith opening up this vast cosmic world that obliterates this line between this life and what happens afterwards. There is on your sheet also a wonderful quotation from a favorite play of mine. How many of you have seen Thornton Wilder's Our Town? Some of you know the play. You know this scene uh, uh, where Emily has passed away and she's given by the stage manager who represents God, she's given a chance to go back and see her family and spend one day reliving her birthday when she was a young girl. And she relives the birthday, she relives the day, and then she says, I can't, I can't go on, it goes so fast. We don't have time to look at one another. She breaks down sobbing. I didn't realize. So all that was going on, and we, so all that was going on, and we never noticed. Take me back up the hill to my grave. But first, wait one more look. Goodbye. Goodbye, world. Goodbye, Grover's Corners. Mama and Papa. Goodbye to clocks ticking. Mama's sunflowers and food and coffee and new iron dresses and hot baths and sleeping and waking up. Oh, Earth, you're too wonderful for anybody to realize you. Final point, and then we'll stop the question because we're almost out of time. Um, instructional psychology, instructional learning. I would like the takeaway to be here uh, something that probably most of you already know, and that is that there are certainly more ways of learning than explicit, um, explicit statement than what we read and what we say. One of the takeaways from the Mizuguchi scene should be that it's possible to look beyond the words and even possible to look beyond the actions and see in a work of art here a way in which the visualization itself is a mode of transmission in terms of a deeper idea or a deeper context. So it's this, this extraordinary thing that the arts do if you engage, from, as Flannery O'Connor said, from the point of view of Christian doctrine that anchors the way you see. It's the lens through which you see the arts and through which you see the world. There is this extraordinary ability of the arts when properly seen to instruct at a level deeper than the level of consciousness, deeper than the level of the overt, which is what we've been talking about, but to reach deeply into people's emotional lives and in some cases create a kind of storm wind that readjusts the furniture in, in your interior life. And as it readjusts that furniture, it gets you to think in ways that Joseph Smith, I think, would hope would hopefully would say, expand outwards into the cosmos. Any questions, any final thoughts? Anything from you folks uh, off campus here before we uh, stop in two minutes? And a hush fell on the crowd. <laughs> Well, thanks. I appreciate your time. appreciate the privilege of being here. I teach, I do teach at the University of Utah, and I was just telling Professor McDonald that I do miss the students at BYU. I really do. You're, um, you're a special group, remarkable and a special group, and the difference is palpable. Right? So, okay, thanks for that.